Hi, I'm Chris Standring, and you're on the Inside Track. We have a great show for you today. My special guest is Frank Potenza, who is the head of guitar at USC, and he brings an organ trio with him into the studio. He's got Joe Bag on organ and Jason Harnell on drums. Let's go and meet the guy, shall we? Great to see you. Good to see you. Hi, this is David. With the camera. Hi, David. This is James with the other camera. Hi, James. All right, well, this one's quiet, but I, I do want to try it and see. I mean, yeah. I really quietly at my house. Right. If it's not quiet and you have an amp that's quieter, I yeah. just, I'm not wild about 10, so if you have something with 12s, you should get a probably something with 2 um, I do, but we can do this too. These are razor's edge. Mm hmm. Take that. This is my back camera. Right? And funny See, you know, if I had known this was an all going to be filmed, I would have thought of a bunch of lies to say, like my Ferraris in the shop. Okay. So that was my other product. Oh, I've never even seen one of those. What model is that? Well, it's it's. I think it's like from 1977, two by twelve, and I picked it up off eBay and is it that had it, 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 it had never been played it would lit, it was literally sitting in some guy's studio for for 20 30 years and I, I, I can't remember what I bought it for but I mean look at the condition it's in it's amazing <laughs> ridiculous <laughs> It's the same, it's very yeah. similar. Alright, so that would be, but I'm not going to hear that when I'm playing. Yes, you am, am I wearing headphones or? Yes. Oh, okay. But it's, but it's up to you if, you, if you really want to use what you're used to. I mean, I'll set it up. So okay. you're going to have to plug into your TC to split out, aren't you? Ah, uh, alright. Well, I'll just get mine. Okay. Just don't take it home. <laughs> Thinking it's yours. <laughs> If you look at uh, guitar players run a couple of different articles where it's like the 10 chord shootout, 10 cable shootout, and some of the ones that win some of the tests are the George L's, which is the cheapest one. Okay. Yeah. So it's not necessarily money right. yeah. that is the deciding factor. It's like you know, it's just some of them have what you're looking for, and some yeah. of them don't. See it, man. Yeah. See it. Uh, do you have your, your? I can get it. I can get it. Um, um, I just want to let you know it's here. I'm glad you all. All right. I can't do it without you. I talked to Jason, he's on his way. Those are your headphones, Frank. Okay. And, um, I mean, we can get you at level now before the other guys show up. All right, let's do it. Put the headphones on so I can, so you can hear me. I'm glad I wore my good shirt. <laughs> How you doing? Good to see you. Good to see you. Good How are you, man? Gosh, it's been a long time. Man. You too. Wow. How are you, man? <laughs> Good. Yeah. Good. Nice to see you, man. Yeah. How's it been? Been like ten years or something? Yeah. Maybe more. It's been a long time, yeah, yeah, man. Yeah. yeah. Glad you could do this. Hey, I'm glad to be here. How young were you when you started playing guitar? Probably eleven or twelve. Um, guitar wasn't my first instrument. I guess it's not a secret, but accordion was my first instrument. No kidding. And that's the instrument that I studied formally. I took lessons. I learned to read music on accordion. And, uh, and my grandfather, as soon as he heard me play an Italian song on the accordion, I shot to the top of the wheel. Um, so now, of course, you are the head honcho of uh, uh, USC Studio Guitar Department, mm -hmm. aren't you? That's got to be a big commitment. It is. It's you know, and I majored in music education yeah. in my undergraduate. So, but it was at the time, it was like a fallback plan. Mm -hmm. It was all right. Well, I, I really want to play, um, but if that doesn't work out well, at least I can kind of fall back on the teaching thing. Which you know, all right. So I was young, and that was the way I viewed it. But 
I've wound up being a lot more involved in education and it's turned out to be a lot more of a gratifying involvement than I ever thought it would. Mm -hmm. I mean, this job at USC is just it's like a dream job. Mm -hmm. and how, how are the students this year? <laughs> They're incredible. They're, you know, they say this every year. They get yeah. younger and more talented yeah, every yeah. year or I get older and less talented. Mm -hmm. What do you find every year when you get new students at USC? What stares you in the face that everybody has, a, has an issue with? Like, a, like an overall general problem? I'm kind of the um, fundamentals guy. Mm -hmm. not the, it's not that nobody else focuses on fundamentals, but when I wrote the courses that I teach, a lot of what I focused on is just fun, fundamentals because even at the level that some of these guys come in, or girls come in playing, there's still holes in their fundamentals. And I think college is a good time, especially as an undergraduate, to be focusing on making sure that you don't have any holes in your, in your basics mm -hmm. and that you're really kind of like, you know, comfortable with a whole bunch of different basic skills that a lot of us kind of sort of let slide. Sure. Well, tell us a little bit about the first song you're going to play today. Ah, uh, The More I See You is something that I learned, I think I probably became familiar with it from Chris Montez's hit version of it in 1966.
from? I grew up in Southern California. So you're a California guy? Yeah. I mean, I spent some time in New York for a while, uh, but uh, moved out here probably 15 plus years ago. So one of my uh, main accounts was Jack Sheldon, kind of legendary West Coast uh, trumpet player, vocalist, comedians. Um, but a lot of people that kind of come through town too. I played a bunch with Bobby Hutcherson. And, Alphonse Muzan and Larry Coriel and uh, Anthony Wilson trio, organ trio. I guess you probably got super serious about it w when you went to Berkeley, is that right? I wanted to study at Berkeley, I wanted to learn more about jazz, but I was listening to Eric Clapton and, you know, sure. rock guys. Yeah. So, you know, we'd go to clubs, we'd hear Led Zeppelin on the first tour, we'd hear Jeff Beck on the tour with Rod Stewart, we you know, that stuff, that was what I was really interested in. And I had already discovered George Benson. So George was the guy that kind of, for me, didn't sound like an old guy, but he was playing stuff that was like pretty sophisticated and he was my gateway into playing jazz. Did you have any particular mentors at Berkeley? Who, who taught you guitar? Mick Goodrick was he? my teacher for three years. And uh, so yeah, he, he was a really important kind of Taskmaster. I mean, he, you know, when you went to your lesson and you weren't prepared, he basically told you you were all done after five minutes and come back when you're prepared kind of thing. So, you know, that lit the fire under me and really was a good sort of like way of kind of making me find the discipline to really practice and really learn something about the instrument and the music. James Moody, Dizzy Gillespie, am I right? Did I read that correctly? Mm -hmm. How did you get uh, hooked up with those guys? Well, James Doesn't Moody. Get better than that. No, James Moody played. Uh, when I was with Gene Harris, James Moody played a, a week or two weeks with us at Yoshi's. So I got a chance to play Moody's Mood for Love. I guess it was a week, for a whole week with James Moody, which I, I count myself very fortunate for. Sure. He was great. So, you know, things like that. A lot of them came about as a result of just circumstances that I couldn't possibly have arranged myself. Mm -hmm. I taught at City College and we would bring in guest artists and Dizzy came in and they needed a band. And, the guy who was the director said, do you want to play guitar on this? And I said, do you need to ask, yeah, yeah, you know? Yeah, yeah. And I brought Joe Pass in and I played with him there. And, and so there were a lot of circumstances like that that just came about by just total whatever. I'm in the right place at the right time. Yeah. What's the second song you're going to play for? Cole Porter's I Love You. This tune was basically written by Cole Porter on a bet. Somebody bet him that, you know, he couldn't write a, a, a good tune using the hackneyed phrase, I love you.
All of my family's musicians, and my dad was at the time living in, in uh, Philadelphia. My dad was the um, on-camera musical director for the Mike Douglas show, and he did that for a few years and was looking to get into film scoring and, and writing for TV and movies, so he, the whole clan moved out to Los Angeles for him to pursue that. Uh, I met Frank through my good friend Joe Bag. Uh, Joe and I have been playing together for years, and uh, Joe was responsible for introducing me to Frank, and we've been playing together I don't know, four, three or four years now, I guess. But, but you're interesting, Frank, because so many guys um, that, that have the background that you have tend to go into the studio scene and they end up playing rock and roll in TV shows and movies. Your resume is very much a jazz sideman, isn't it? And of course, you're, 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 you're an, a, a solo artist as well. Mm -hmm. But was that a conscious decision for you to go into a more focused sort of jazz direction, or, or was it nature taking its course? Well, I mean, as you well know, there are certain turns that your career takes that are directed or generated by opportunities that come up. Sure. So in some cases, you're asked to do something and you think, no, I won't do that, or yes, I really want to do that, or well, you know, I'm broke, I'll do that, or for whatever reason, the motivating factors might be. Um, in some cases, things that were offered to me I just found them not to be so appealing. I would much rather be out on a gig and playing in front of a live audience um, than being in a recording studio. And I've yeah. done a lot of studio work and I spent yeah. a lot of time in, you know, trying to make other people's music sound good. And that's an interesting challenge and it's really difficult and it's like my hat is off to people that make that their main career. But I found out early on that what really excites me and kind of makes me excited about getting up in the morning is in front of a live audience. That's what really kind of scares me. That's what makes me feel alive. And I suspect um, your relationship with Joe Pass probably held that too, would, would you say? Yeah, because he was the guy that I, a woman of many, but he was, you know, I got to know him. I had the good fortune, he was a hero of mine, and I got to know him mm. well and spend a lot of time with him. And I would watch him play, especially, you know, any of the gigs, but especially solo, you know, where he'd yeah. just have a whole room full of people in the palm of his hand, and I would think to myself, that's something to do right there. Mm -hmm. That's really difficult, and that is a challenge, and that scares me to death. Well, I'll tell you something. When I lived in England, I was a member of Ronnie Scott's Jazz Club. And back in the day, if you were a member of the Musicians' Union in London, you could get into Ronnie Scott's for a pound. And Joe Pass would come into town, and he would be there for a week. You know, and I ended up going at least three times uh -huh. a week. I mean, every single time he came. Yeah, I feel very fortunate to have had that relationship and I've had occasion to meet and play with a lot of my heroes. Gene my Harris, friends. you were in Gene Harris's band for a while. Yeah. Did you take did you um, take over from Ron Esch Day? Yes. Yeah. And and actually Luther Hughes was very helpful in right. my getting that gig and kind of sort of advanced my yeah. cause and all yeah. that stuff and, and, and it was it was really fun and it's like that I still miss being able to do that. Oh, it was just such a fun yeah. band. Wonderful. I don't know about you, but I get a lot of emails from people saying, how do you get a great jazz guitar tone? And um, I've got my own theories about this, but I'm, I'm interested to know what you would say to people who have that. Well, you know, some of them have inferior instruments, or they have instruments that have inferior components, or electronics, or whatever. But, you know, for the most part, even if you have a really good instrument put in your hands, that's no guarantee that you're going to make a beautiful sound in the yeah. instrument. I mean, a lot of it is touch, a lot of it is the way you touch the instrument. Sure. You've got a new record out, haven't you? A recently new record for, uh, called For Joe, which, by the way, I've got to tell you, I mean, that album for Django was, is probably what, what I call my Desert Island disc. Yeah, that's I mean, a it's just, it, I mean, it's, it's the it's perfect jazz guitar album, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. And uh, so I love the fact that you, um, that you did this record, and it's, it's, a, it's a great record too. Did you have fun making it? it it's something I, that I waited 20 years to do. Yeah. Joe passed in 94, and uh, I thought about doing something that was some kind of dedication, a tribute to him, and at some point, I talked to John about this quite a long time ago, and he said, yeah, that would be good, you know, we, we could do that. And John Pisano. John Pisano, but it never really kind of came to fruition until about a year before we did it, I was in Denver and I was playing and the guy who's the head of the record company I'm with and I were sitting 
And I mentioned the idea that, you know, I play with John a lot, and I said, you know, I would like to do something, and I, I just kind of broached the subject of doing a tribute to Joe, and I said I could even do it with the same rhythm section as he had on the For Django, mm. and, and he, his eyes lit up, and he mm. said, you could get those guys. I said, they're all friends of mine, and I play with them all, and it's like, is this something that you, and, and he just got really excited about yeah. it, which thrilled me to no end. Were the sessions filmed, or that was something else? Oh yeah, no, it was, it was filmed. So that's the documentary? Yeah. Not, what's it called? It's uh, called The Not So Average Not So Average Joe. Joe. Well, that's great, Frank. I really appreciate you coming in. It's been, been My fantastic. Pleasure. Thank great you, to man. see you again. So that's our show. I hope you enjoyed it. Big thanks to my special guests, Frank Potenza, Jason Harnell, and Joe Bag. And we'll see you next time on the Inside Trends. So, so let's just keep it shorter then. So yeah. I'll play a chorus, you play a chorus, head out, no, we're done. No, 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 That'll no. cut two minutes All off right, it right there. Yeah. Sorry, Jason. Okay. <laughs> but you did play beautifully.